Chapter 11. That morning was one we had music. Mom had been giving us lessons since we were little. Lexi played piano, so with Teresa's oboe, my trumpet, and Mom's cello, we played a lot of group pieces. We weren't a string quartet, but Mom created her own arrangements for us based on many classic ones. We had been working on her variation of Beethoven's String Quartet No. 15 in A minor. Mom led us off, the deep tone of the cello setting an eerie aura. Each of us was to join one by one, almost in a fugal pattern, as we gradually repeated the melody in succession. There were leading tones on the strong beat, and then there were quiet, slower half notes that felt mysterious, almost sinister. Not a picker-upper by any means. My trumpet took the violin's part, which had a difficult entrance of running sixteenth notes. I took a breath, pressed my lips to the silver mouthpiece, and began. Lexi slammed her hands on the keys, the sound loud and discordant. Cut, Eli, you were frickin' late. I took my lips away from the mouthpiece. Was not. Mom kept playing. Watch your language, Lexi. You're both doing fine. Let's pick it up where we are. Come on. Lexi groaned. She started playing again. Teresa and I joined in. Teresa's oboe played the part of the bass, and the rest of us played in opposition to her. The intensity and volume grew as we moved through the piece. We were good. The piece was long, but we had no more interruptions or mistakes. As it came to a close, the harmony strengthened and progressed to the simple ending, which was a solo for me with accompanying chords from Lexi. At least our instruments cooperated, no small feat considering Lexi's clenched jaw and drilling stare. For a few moments, I felt like we belonged together. Like we had bonded through the music, if not through circumstance. At the end of the session, we put our instruments away in silence. Lexi stormed away quickly while Mom fiddled with the latch on the cello case, distracted. Therese just smiled to herself and didn't make eye contact with me. My palms were sweaty and my stomach felt queasy. Music was supposed to be soothing. Like most of our music days, I found myself grasping my trumpet, taking my time as I shined it before putting it back into its case. Despite the discordance, I was reluctant to end the session. But with a click, the case closed, and I was back to feeling alone. In the middle of the afternoon, Dad came into the library where I was reading. I'm working on inventory, and I need you to help. He announced flatly. Inventory sucked. I tossed Stephen King onto one of the leather chairs. Dad sent me to one of the larger storage rooms and left me on my own with a yellow legal pad and a pen. Everything had to be accounted for. Every jar of pickles, every bottle of laundry detergent, every box of feminine hygiene products. Lovely. The task took me about three hours, filled several pages, and yielded few surprises. For five years, I'd done this chore dutifully following my father's orders. I'd watched the piles of jars, bottles, and boxes slowly shrink. Not to emergency levels, but still. When I came to the boxes of cleaning supplies, our least necessary inventory in my opinion, I noticed an opening at the back between stacks of paper towels and cartons of toilet paper. No clue why I bothered moving them aside. Before, I'd always just estimated by the height of the stack. But as I shifted them for the first time ever, there was a plastic tub that seemed out of place with all the cardboard containers around it. I lugged it down from the shelf and read the one word written in black Sharpie on the blue cover. Eddie. My knees buckled. I dropped to the floor. With one trembling finger, I traced the letters. I hadn't seen his name in writing for so long. Hadn't thought of him for a few hours. Seeing those letters together so familiar and heartbreaking at the same time. I tore off the cover. Plastic bags of jack links. Lots of them. Beef jerky, turkey jerky, sausage sticks. Eddie's favorite food on earth. I ripped open a bag of jerky and stuck my nose deep inside. I breathed in the one scent that could bring my brother alive to me. Inside the storage closet, I remained on the cement floor for a long time, inhaling my twin. My stomach rumbled. It occurred to me I might be holding an important find. The wrapper crinkled as I bit off a hunk of jerky. A bit past its prime, but still tasty, 
still meat. I downed two-thirds of a bag before replacing the top of the tub. I carried it into the kitchen. Therese sat at the counter. Mom sliced tomatoes for a salad. Despite the deep circles under her eyes and slumped shoulders, Mom smiled when she saw the look on my face. What's that? My hands guided the box onto the counter. I slid onto a stool. Therese read the cover. Eddie's box? At one time, we all had a box. A box filled with our favorite treat. Snickers for me, plain M&Ms for Therese, coffee-flavored nips for Mom, corn nuts for Dad. I didn't know what Lexi's was. She never ate junk food at home, but she must have had a box, too. Mom lifted the cover and laughed. Her eyes lit up for the first time in a while. Oh, I hate this stuff. It smelled so greasy and smoky. He always reeked of it. I held up a bag. It's meat. Mom's brow furrowed. It's still good. I don't want anyone getting sick. The ingredients list didn't indicate much. I'm not sure if it was ever good. Yet moments before chewing the jerky, I'd tasted the saltiness, felt the weight of it, the substance that vegetables and other foods lacked. Yeah, it's still edible. I realized how much I missed meat. But it belongs to Eddie. Little Miss Perfect looked from me to Mom. Mom smiled at Therese. Lovey, I don't think Eddie would mind. Therese opened a bag. She gnawed off a chunk of jerky. Rather difficult to chew. Mom reached for a piece. Together they chewed the jerky. Sloppy and loud. It's not so bad. Mom went back to making a salad. Therese picked an unopened bag out of the box and ran from the room. I told Mom... Be right back. There was a little business I had to take care of. In the hall, I caught up to Therese and grabbed her by her hood, yanking her back. How'd you get in my room? Her mouth was full, and she finished chewing as she tried to wrestle away from me. Open the door. I gripped harder and pulled so that she was bent over backward, looking up at me. You can't have just opened the door. It was locked. Ow, let go! She put a hand on the wall to keep her balance. Tell me how you got in. She rolled her eyes. I read Oliver Twist. Say what? And he picks locks? She twisted as far as she could to one side, but I had such a tight hold of her hood, she only succeeded in almost strangling herself. She huffed. Not exactly, but it got me interested. So I found a book in the library. I shook my head. On how to pick locks. You'd think I might have found that one at some point. She spoke fast probably figuring I'd let her go as soon as she told me everything. It was that one for kids that shows how everything is made. It tells how things work, and I learned about locks and figured it out. I let her go and stepped back, leaning against the wall. I lowered my voice. So what other locks have you picked down here? She stuck out her tongue as she skipped backward, away from me. I'm not telling you. And she ran off down the hall. I went back in the kitchen... She's such a little fuck. Mom shook a finger at me. You shouldn't say that about her, and I think she's better now that she moved in. She trailed off, like she didn't mean to say the words. Moved in where? The yellow room. Mom, how could you let her do that? Her eyes narrowed. Watch your tone. And she spends so much time in there anyway, I didn't see any harm. Whatever, I just miss everyone being normal. Then I smiled and tried to make light. Actually, I miss a lot of things. Mom sighed. I miss... She hesitated, her eyes on the wilting lettuce. I would give anything for a huge whole milk for pump latte right now with loads of caramel sauce. She shrugged and went back to the salad. I watched her for a bit. Her shoulders seemed slumped, and her movements were mechanical, almost robotic. Mom, I ventured. You happy? She paused, staring into the salad bowl. Happy? I'm alive, warm, reasonably fed. My family, most of it, is here with me. Her eyes met mine. I never dreamed I could be this miserable, ever. 
Don't get me wrong, I'm grateful. Grateful that my husband went to all this trouble. I saw the question in her eyes at the same time I felt it in my gut. What are we surviving for? I asked. She nodded. Did we survive simply for the sake of surviving? The rest of our lives we just exist to survive? Tears welled up as she set a hand on her stomach. I wanted so much for my children. For a while, you had it all. Good schools, everything you could want to make a great childhood, and I was happy. Down here, though, she took a deep breath and let it out. Her voice had a slight quiver to it. You are all so affected by this place in your own ways. My first inclination was to disagree, and I started to protest. Her expression shut me up. Don't deny it, Eli. I want us to thrive again, but this isn't it. It isn't even close. Her hands went up to cover her face as her shoulders shook. I just sat there, sat there and watched her weep. Part of me wanted to hold her. All of me knew that's what a good son would do. Alas, I fell neatly into the category of a lousy son. I snatched some napkins off the counter and set them down next to her. Thanks. She wiped her eyes, then blew her nose. You know, your father and I aren't sharing a room anymore. I thought of the couch in Dad's office, the pillow and blanket. Not like we had a guest room for him to retreat to. But I didn't want her to know I'd noticed anything. Since when? For a while. We don't agree on a few things. She patted her belly. It was pretty clear to me that the gesture referred to the supplements. They meant only one thing to my father, yet clearly they were something else entirely to my mother. And all that time I had been suffering from the delusion that I could remain uninvolved choosing to side with neither of them. I put both my elbows on the counter and rested my chin on my hands. Mom, if you could leave here, would you? She wiped her eyes again. Only if it didn't put any of you in danger. You just said you want us to thrive. She nodded. Yes, I do. But I also want you alive. And if surviving is all we can have at this point, I guess I just have to live with that. I sat back up. My fingers pulled at the collar of my T-shirt. Do you think things are really like Dad says? She peeked in the oven door. I have no way of knowing. I had expected her to reassure me, tell me that Dad knew what he was doing like he always did. But her answer gave me an opening, an opening to see if I could trust her. And I needed to trust her. I swallowed. Did he tell you the internet is up? Mom grabbed the edge of the oven to steady herself. What? Her surprise was definitely genuine. I take it that's a no. I told her what Dad had told me. She sat down. Her face was pale. You know, my mother never wanted me to marry your father. Why not? She'd never talked to me this way before, like an adult. Oh, where should I start? He was such a complete package, you know? Smart, good-looking, rich. I usually liked taller men, but, you know, I figured he could always stand on his wallet. She grinned, but it looked uncomfortable. My forced laugh felt the same way. She shrugged a bit. Your Graham just didn't trust him. She said he seemed too controlling. All I saw was a man who could make my dreams and the dreams of my future children come true. She paused. I really didn't want to hear any more. Despite everything, that had always been a constant for me. Something to draw strength from. My parents and the life they made together. Not perfect, but strong, nonetheless. It was not pleasant to find out the foundation of your house had dry rot. She continued. And he was so involved with the orphanage, he never hesitated when I saw Lexi and knew I had to take her home with us. I knew my kids would never want for anything. I know it might sound shallow to you, Eli, but it was such a relief to know I was marrying a man I wouldn't have to fight over money with.
was my turn to say something. All I could come up with was... And now? The oven's timer buzzed. Mom stood pulling on her thick red oven mitts. I honestly don't know. I watched Mom pull a loaf of flatbread out of the oven. She chewed on the inside of one cheek, distorting her face. As she set the hot, fresh bread on the cooling rack, the funny-smelling bread that no one but Dad would eat, I could tell what was running through her mind. Dad came in then, sat beside me, and asked for my inventory sheets. He scanned the page and then scratched his neck. Uh, I'm not sure where I miscalculated, but my last figures were off. Mom must have decided it was a good time to start talking to him again. Is this where you tell us when the food will run out? Her voice was full of worry, yet there was also a harsh tone to it. Dad didn't even notice. His finger trailed down a paper on his clipboard. About a year before the 15 years are up, depending on the hydroponics, of course. He could have been giving us the weather report. Mom tapped the knife on the cutting board. The vegetables will last. We'll have enough food. I spoke up. Why can't we just be vegetarians? Dad laughed a little as he dropped his pen on the clipboard and shoved it aside. They rely on eggs and dairy products for protein. What about vegans? They don't eat any animal products, do they? Mom answered me. Because they have soy products and nuts for protein. Your father was never a fan of soy, and the nuts are long gone. Dad leaned his head to one side as he looked at her. He stood up and walked over to the counter. He sliced off a piece of bread and tossed it between his hands to cool. By my calculations, protein will be totally lacking. We won't have a choice. Mom snapped at him. There's always a choice. Of course there's a choice. Do you want to live or die? He held up the bread to me. Bread? No. Mom's face fell as she looked from Dad to the bread. I mean, there's another loaf for the kids. Still baking. She gestured at the oven. This one's all yours. Dad smiled. Thanks. He bit into the bread. My head started to hurt. Dad shifted his gaze to Mom. Yes, there's always a chance we won't have to go to extreme measures, but we won't know until that time. And we need to set ourselves up now. We must do what we can. We need to bolster our supplemental food supply. She glared at him. Unless you've come up with something to guarantee multiple births, I'm already working at my quota. But the look on her face showed she regretted her words. He cut another slice. Eli, come with me. Mom shook her head. Don't do this, Rex. His voice was low. Eli, let's go. She dropped the knife on the counter and watched us leave. What was going on? Dad walked slightly in front of me as we headed toward the direction of his office. Eli, I'm going to need your help. Both his hands started to scratch his face. All that scratching was uncomfortable for me to watch, and it was making me itchy again. I wanted to grab his hands, make him stop, but I couldn't. Instead, I looked down at my feet. With what? Your mother and I can only, well, work so fast, so to speak. My stomach lurched. What am I supposed to do? He cleared his throat. Well, there are other ways to enhance our food supply. I didn't know where his reasoning was headed. Or maybe I didn't want to admit it. My mind was so clouded that I missed his next few words. Dad kept on. It would be a true experiment since no one has done it before, but think if I could pull it off. He grinned. I could patent the process and it could be used for generations. It would revolutionize medicine. People in need of organ transplants wouldn't have to wait. And uh, I miss what you said. What would revolutionize medicine? We reached his office, and he unlocked it, ushering me in. Then he walked over to the padlocked door and pulled a key out of his pocket. With a twist, he had the padlock off, and his hand was on the knob. Are you ready? As the door swung open, my first impression was a glare of white light. When I stepped inside, 
I realized it was the whiteness of the room enhanced by the fluorescent bulbs running everywhere overhead. The room was a laboratory, so full of equipment and so big that it made the other lab look like a low-budget high school classroom. My jaw dropped as I took a few steps farther in. After all this time, a part of our world that I had no idea existed. Long white counters ran hundreds of yards in front of me, each lined with test tubes and beakers and enormous intimidating microscopes. Along the walls sat machines I'd never seen before. A lump formed in my throat. Dad, what do you do in here? What would revolutionize medicine? His tone was matter of fact. Cloning a human being. I backed away from him. The words almost didn't make it out of my mouth. What in the world are you proposing? Dad picked up a test tube and peered at the substance inside. He jotted something on a nearby clipboard. We've been doing it the old-fashioned way. We need to step it up and make more supplements the newfangled way. I retched, barely making it to a sink before I puked up all the jerky. As the faucet went full blast, I lifted up the bottom of my t-shirt and wiped my face. My back was to him. You can't mean that. He grunted, annoyed. Come on, Eli. I whirled to face him again. It goes against nature, you know that. Besides, none of those animal clones lived more than a short time. Dad tilted his head a bit, looking at me. Eli, Eli, Eli. When are you going to realize you're just like me? Eddie isn't... It wasn't. Not by a long shot, but you. You are. You'll do whatever it takes, anything, to make sure you come out on top. That's not true. His analysis was akin to that clown's telling me I was the evil twin. My head hurt behind my left eye and my vision started to blur. He nodded. Yeah, it is. You can't deny what you are. My head moved from side to side. I won't do it. You can't make me help you. He sighed. No, I can't. You're right. He drummed his fingers on the counter. Dad seemed like he'd actually listened to me. So I offered up an olive branch. It's just weird, you know. I gestured at the scene around me. Cloning people. And besides, don't you need a human host at some point? And Mom's already got a tenant, so to speak. Dad shrugged a bit. And there's Lexi. Was he insane? I know, Lexi. She won't do it. He chuckled a bit. <laughs> do you? Do you really know your sister? Oh, God, no. I probably didn't. He set the test tube down and picked up another. I've already spoken to Lexi. She's waiting for you to get on board. I turned, heading out the door and through his office, making it to the corridor mere seconds before I broke down. Harsh sobs racked my body as I leaned on a wall. Was this what our life had become? I hadn't ever loved life in here. Tolerated it, maybe. But hearing my father's plan for our continued survival caused a major shift inside of me. Any lingering tolerance, any sliver of ambivalence had fled, gone for good. The space they left in me abruptly filled with hate for everything about the compound. I refused to live that way. There wasn't anything I could do about it by myself. Maybe it was time to take sides. I hoped I could find someone to be on.